The world's first motor car, the Benz of 1886. Today, a hundred years later, we're celebrating the agony and the ecstasy of motoring. That old Benz changed a lot, not just our way of travelling, but in the end, the way we make things. It was, after all, in the early days of car building that we discovered mass production. In Australia, this says it all, the FX, the first Holden, the 1948 symbol of our manufacturing maturity. Incidentally, that coveted collector's item, the FJ, didn't appear until 1953. So, in the year of the motor car centenary and General Motors Holden's fourth $100 million loss in six years, here's the first episode of a two-part quantum special on what we used to call Australia's own car. Australia's infatuation with the Holden began when this car, Holden No. 1, was launched by Prime Minister Ben Chifley in November 1948. Its arrival signalled the end of austerity, the end of rationing and the start of a new and prosperous era. The baby boom, suburban sprawl and corporate advertising at the movies. Ah, that was good. The boss seems pleased with me. <laughs> Won't be my fault if he isn't. I have orders to please him for the rest of my days, and you bet I will. Today, these old cars represent something special to many Australians. They symbolise a time when, as we proudly boasted, we lived in the best country in the world when Australian made for Australian conditions meant jobs for all. But why are these cars important? Why do we remember them so fondly? The fact that we could make this car showed that Australia's manufacturing industry had at last joined the modern age of mass production. What we tend to forget is that these first Holdens, although conceived in Australia, were designed and engineered for us by Americans even though Australians had had the skills to make a car for many years. Probably the first car to be made successfully in Australia was the Tarrant. Between 1897 and 1907, Harley Tarrant painstakingly built 16 cars in his Melbourne factory, including this 1906 model. It is an all-Australian car, except for the Magneto, and features one of the first four-cylinder engines ever made. The sturdy engineering proved ideal for local conditions, but handmade manufacture was prohibitively expensive. They cost between three and five hundred pounds each. Tarrant intended to scale up production, but was beaten to the mark by the mass-produced Model T Ford, which could be landed in Australia for only 199 pounds. In 1908, Tarrant stopped making his own car and began making a fortune instead, importing and assembling the Fords. It was a precedent that would take Australian manufacturers decades to overcome. Cars are cars all over the world. Cars are cars all over the world. Similarly made. There are now over 8 million motor vehicles in this country, more than one for every two inhabitants. Today's cars cost, in real terms, about a tenth as much as the handmade Tarrants. Cars have now become a disposable consumer item. Motor vehicles cost Australians $18 billion a year. It's not that the materials are expensive, a few hundred kilograms of steel, plastic, glass and rubber, that costs less than $300 per vehicle. But it requires the coordinated efforts of over 4,000 companies to make a car. This costs three to $5,000 per vehicle. It costs you three times that amount because of advertising, dealer markups, transport and tax. The crunch for the car makers is the tooling. To mass produce a car requires at least a billion dollars worth of equipment. This modern Holden is still basically similar to the 1906 Tarrant. 
it still has a water-cooled petrol-driven engine, rear-wheel drive and a steel body shell. What is different is the method of manufacture, mass production, now the very core of any country's industry. The growth of our car industry, the Holden story, is the industrial history of this country in microcosm. The Holden resulted from decades of gradual industrial development as we learn to mass produce the different parts which make a car. There were also rapid bursts of growth, but only when we were forced to make things on our own because of international crises. In the shipping crisis of World War I, German U-boats virtually isolated Australia from the Northern Hemisphere. This was indirectly responsible for our first steps in vehicle mass production. Cargo space became so tight that in 1917, Prime Minister Billy Hughes declared that for every two chassis imported, only one fully assembled car would be allowed in. Holden and Frost was one of many companies which began to make cabs for the imported chassis. The Adelaide-based company had made carriage bodies and mass-produced harnesses for the army. These high-volume production methods, with each worker making only one part of the harness, suited vehicle building. Holden's had a meteoric growth. In 1918, 20 workers produced 600 bodies, mainly by hand and with no production line. The workers moved from vehicle to vehicle. By 1924, Holden's had a new factory at Woodville in Adelaide. They were making 35,000 bodies a year for 20 makes of car, with, by this stage, a moving production line. The largest customer was General Motors Australia, for whom they were sole supplier. Vic Reeves' first job as a boy was as a motor trimmer. He recalls a certain attention to detail. Actually, from the rear up until this section here was manufactured at uh, the uh, Woodville plant. And the whole motor body is actually mounted on a wooden framework to which are nailed the various metal panels. Uh, here's a very good example of the uh, nailing of the metal panels to the stout wooden framework. And all the trimming was then also nailed to the wooden framework. The uh, tradesmen were very meticulous with their work to the extent that even the screw heads had to all line up in the one direction, and here's a very good example. Holden's maintained their market lead by using the latest technology. When solid roofs were introduced, welding was used for the first time to put them together. They were the first to use body presses, even though the steel had to be imported from Britain. On at least one occasion, when the shipping was held up, suburban Woodville's corrugated iron fences were plundered for the presses. Car sales continued to boom through the late 1920s and as techniques improved, the cost of a car dropped to as little as 150 pounds. But in 1929, the roaring 20s collapsed into the depression. Holdens, who had made 47,000 bodies in 1927, could only sell 1,700 in 1931. Hundreds of workers were sacked and the factory stood virtually idle. Government money restrictions meant General Motors couldn't take any earnings out of the country. At the same time, Holden's, with their overcapitalized factory, faced bankruptcy. In 1931, it made sense for the two companies to merge into General Motors Holden's. Another crucial step in building a car was the growth of the component industry, which also dates from the Depression. Today, component manufacture is one of our big success stories. Over half the 22,000 components in this car come from independent Australian companies. In 1930, the Scullin government, desperate to boost local industry, placed selective tariffs on any components which could be made here. Bob Chamberlain is a pioneer of the components industry. These days, he and his brother Bill are restoring two 1910 tours for the Benz Centenary. In their heyday, however, the brothers ran Chamberlain Industries, producing tractors and machinery. They started out in the early 30s making pistons for their own racing car. The pistons worked, so they went commercial. 
We didn't know a great deal about it. The market was entirely for replacement purposes. There were no cars being built in Australia at the time, but there were cars of every make and model from all over the world. To service the entire industry, we had to make 400 different types of pistons. These were made all uh, in small quantities. The usual procedure was for the uh, people who wanted the part to say, well, this is the part that we've been importing. Uh, how much can you uh, make it for in Australia? And with the assistance of the uh, skull and uh, tariffs to protect us, uh, we were able to survive. As Australia struggled out of the Depression, GMH continued to turn out bodies for many different makes of cars. But they could not make a profit. The Americans could not understand Holden's small-scale production methods, while the Australians couldn't follow the Americans' management logic. The General decided to appoint its whiz kid, Larry Hartnett, from Vauxhall in England, to either sort the company out or close it down. Well, I arrived here in March uh, 1934, uh, still a director of Vauxhall Motors, where I'd been for four years, getting the uh, um, uh, Bedford truck started. I had certain uh, impressions about Australia that it was very heavily protected with a complicated tariff, and uh, my instructions or request was that I should either uh, make it go, uh, this combination or combine between General Motors of Australia and the Holden Body Company, or close it down. It was in a very bad state. It was about three or four hundred thousand in the red ink pounds, that is. And uh, I quickly uh, changed my mind. I was very impressed with the uh, uh, work being carried out, particularly at Woodville in the body plant. Hartnett, a man of masterly management skills, quickly turned the company round. He restructured it, encouraged local efficiency, and stepped up training. His management style had quite an effect on the workforce. This dynamic little dynamo come rushing through like a, you know, like a shark with his pilot fish, flew through the place. He seemed to know what he, what he was talking about, you know, and uh, then off he went. Don Jordan began work as an assistant draftsman at GMH in the mid-1930s. There was almost an evangelistic attitude in that whole drawing office, which was the hub virtually at that time of, of, of Holden's. And I couldn't figure out what it was, why everybody seemed to be working at high pressure and not, not worrying about it, you know? And many weeks when I'd sort of got over that initial shock and it sort of fitted myself into the, into the gang, I suddenly realised what, what it was, that there was, there was leadership and there was top organisation in that company. By 1935, Holdens were making 93 different body styles at once. This was clearly impossible using conventional methods, so they developed a technique of sharing body panels. A limited range of panels was made and were mixed and matched for different makes and models. The whole process was practical, economical and gave the customer a wide choice. This was a major breakthrough in the world in bodybuilding. Clearly, the Americans couldn't understand because the way they make a car is to take a Chevrolet. I mean, they set up the tooling for a Chevrolet and they make so many Chevs, you know, till they amortise the tooling and it might go for a couple of years. But nevertheless, they have to do an enormous quantity. Clearly, this couldn't work in Australia. We were making a broad spectrum of cars in small, flexible quantities by this technique of using virtually the one set of dies. From start to finish, all we got was a drawing of a chassis, and that's all we got. And the cars were made, the bodies were built, and they were put end on end, and they waited for the chassis to come out, and when they came out, the cars were flopped on them, screwed down, and sold to the, the public. Highly flexible, highly skilled, uh, and much cheaper that, the, that General Motors America could produce them for. Modern motor vehicle construction dates from the mid-1930s when the wooden frame was abandoned by most makers. Now, even the chassis has been incorporated into the body structure. 
1936, the Woodville plant installed a huge Hamilton press, one of the largest ever made. It was big enough to press the entire top of a car in one piece. The first all-steel roof was pressed in Australia 12 months before it was accomplished by General Motors in America. They had teething troubles. The deep drawing steel was a little wonky for a while, but they got over it and uh, just a bit of trial and error, and bingo, you had a new type of car. And I think at that time, probably Hartnett first conceived the idea in his own mind that Australia was capable of producing a car in its own right. Hartnett knew he had to plan for a future when cars would no longer have chassis. If the industry was to survive, we'd need to make the entire car here. So, when he supervised construction of the new GMH headquarters at Fisherman's Bend in 1936, he set aside an area where an engine foundry could be built. His confidence that Australia could one day make a car was widely discussed, though most experts, particularly from rival companies, were opposed to the idea. Why build cars here when they could be imported? Australian industry was much too primitive to build a motor car engine. Then, suddenly, we were at war, and alone again. We were cut off from all overseas supplies for 22 months between Dunkirk and Pearl Harbor, and America was very, very neutral. So we had to fend for ourselves, and the doing of it, we uh, advanced industry uh, by the equivalent of 10 or 20 years of necessity. Uh, that gave a great improvement for the making of a motor car. With GMH on a war footing, the workers soon found themselves making items that they'd never dreamed of making before. One of the first jobs was to build a de Havilland Gypsy aero engine, the first engine GMH had tackled. Working from a set of outdated French plans in metric, 41,000 measurements had to be converted. Lathes had to be found to make the tools to make the parts. Metals such as magnesium were refined in Australia for the first time and new casting techniques were devised. Within seven months of those first metric conversions, the engine was powering Tiger Moth trainers. Most remarkable of all, though, was that 85 separate subcontractors made the components, and it worked first time. So many small concerns became expert almost overnight. I mean, you take a firm that was making something rough and ready, with crude limits, and you ask him to use a micrometer, it's a big change. So the war, uh, uh, with all the horrors that it did, wars always bring, uh, lifted industry in Australia totally across the whole area by at least 10 years of natural evolution. By the end of the war, GMH had a fully operational foundry making the most complex castings for the General Motors Grey Marine diesel. Today's foundry bears little resemblance to those early efforts, but it was those initial steps which formed the backbone of engine production in this country. Australia now had all the skills needed to build its own car. As soon as the war was over, Ben Chifley's Labour government called for car makers to submit proposals to make an Australian car. Chifley was determined. If no foreign manufacturer would do it, the Australian government would. This suited Hartnett. His engineers had already been working on the car they thought Australia needed. It was to be called Project 2000. You pitch the design on a car on the volume you hope to get. That in turn reflects the income bracket. How much could a man afford uh, in the volume class? Well, it worked out about 25 shillings a week, as much as he could spend on a car. And uh, those days, uh, uh, that was a, a relatively high figure because the basic wage was about six pounds a week. So uh, that was a pretty chunky piece to say 20 shillings for a car. 
That included depreciation and all the things that went with it in operating. So uh, that the six cylinders seemed to be a mark of uh, acceptance in Australia. So we start with a six cylinder car. Now when you design a car, the most important thing is a powder weight ratio. So we picked on 2,000 pounds of weight. And then we decided on the track and the uh, wheelbase and so on. Hartnett got the government go-ahead, but he still had to convince Detroit. The submission he took was for an Australian-made car with US-designed mechanicals and an Australian-designed body. I started by putting to them uh, the characteristics and resources of Australia. Not one of them had ever been to Australia, so uh, many things I said were a great surprise to them. Iron ore mining, uh, they didn't realise that. Production of steel, uh, probably good uh, quality and the lowest price in the world at that time. Uh, even in the war, we'd done optical munitions, optical instruments, manufactured in Australia, made for the war. Uh, statistics of uh, the car sales in the country, the wide variety of models we had to contend with. They didn't know that so much was being done in this country. The tendency to uh, interpret Australia as a big country of open spaces with a man on a horse with a bunch of sheep in the background. And uh, to find that we were producing steel uh, and of a good quality at a low price, that in, in itself was uh, amazing. General Motors President Alfred P. Sloan hated the whole idea and particularly hated the thought of being pushed around by the Australian government. Mr. Sloan was very uh, uh, anti-Australia. He was an extreme Tory, and everybody knew that. Uh, even Roosevelt was an anathema to him. Uh, when it came to a fellow called Chifley in the socialist country of Australia, he did uh, had a fit about it. And uh, asked me, did it, was, was it true the uh, Australian government in the main owned the railways? And I said, yes, yes, it's true. And he said, what a goddamn socialist crowd that must be. I said, well, they even owned the telephones. Well, that was almost rocked him on his chair. But... Uh, the predominant, a uh, good piece of democracy. Uh, C. Wilson, on the other hand, was a uh, uh, pro. And uh, he made a very pointed question to me. Uh, so, uh, well, Larry, uh, supposing we said go ahead, would it be the Chevrolet or the Vauxhall or the Opel? And I said, none of them. It would be designed for low volume for the peculiarities of Australia. Uh, much to my surprise and relief, he says, God damn good horse sense. So, uh, that was an approval. So we got the, the project approved, but not finance. So while the Australian designers began work, the question of finance was tackled. The Commonwealth Bank and the State Bank of South Australia lent General Motors, the world's biggest company, the money to make the first Holdens in Australia. Well, whereas uh, it was approved and agreed that the styling and the sheet metal would be carried out in Australia, uh, and the mechanical parts would be uh, redesigned, as it were, and uh, brought up to date in Detroit. Uh, they did the whole job in America, which upset our ideas of styling. We made a mock-up of what we thought should fit the bill. GMH wanted the first Holden to look like this, a body with large flat panels and enclosed wheels. This did not impress Detroit. They overrode the local design and began to stack Hartnett staff with Americans. That was the then current styling of America, with separate front mudguards or fenders, and we put it all into one side. You can see it more dramatically here. That's our conception of for low volume. Now that kind of styling would go five or six years. All cars followed it later. We were ahead of the parade. That's what we got, which was quite all right. It sold, the market went up, but uh, the, the undertaking was uh, dropped and changed, and that upset me very much. Uh, I had considered that our ability to make low volume bodies was one of the assets of why we should make a car in Australia. When they didn't do that, it was too much for me, I resigned. General Motors found that this small prototype Chevrolet, circa 1942, matched Hartnett's specifications almost exactly. It was slightly reworked and became the basis of the new Holden. Prototypes of the new car were made in Detroit and sent to Fisherman's Bend where they were road tested and components were modified for Australian conditions. 
Then, American technicians supervised the tooling up for production of the first Holden, to be called the 48215. In November 1948, the first Holden was presented to the public. Everyone was there for the launch, except Sir Lawrence Hartnett, who was not invited. The event was dignified with the air of a state occasion. It's the first really big public uh, preview of this car, about which Australia has heard so much, and there's an air of excitement, and if I may say so, a thrill about it. A very nice looking job, got all the latest features, gear shift, the lever is on the steering wheel. It fairly wide, looks as though it would seat comfortably five to six people. Very nice looking job. It's not unlike in appearance the small edition of Chevrolet. Very modern lines. It's really a beautiful looking job. Hartnett's gamble on a locally made car proved correct. The car was a huge success. More than 130 Australian-made cars coming off the production line every day. Proof positive of the tremendous progress of Australian industry and in a country which five years ago couldn't make a car at all. The bodies, the so-called famous aero-built, the first in Australia without a chassis, were produced in the old Woodville plant and after trimming were sent to Fisherman's Bend in Victoria or assembly plants in the other states. At Fisherman's Bend, the engines and transmissions were built and tested using the latest technology. The previous decades of experience were finally paying off. A skilled labour force and up-to-the-minute production methods had combined to deliver an affordable car. Our manufacturing base had come of age. The industrial boom spread to other industries. About 300 outside companies were contracted to make components for GMH. Instead of only being able to make pistons in their hundreds for replacement purposes, we were able to make pistons in their thousands. And by the uh, time we had uh, retired from our business in making pistons, we'd supplied 12 million pistons to General Motors alone. By 1952, Australians had bought 80,000 Holdens. General Motors had paid off their Australian backers and GMH had become a fully owned subsidiary. In the suburbs, owning a Holden had become part of the great Australian dream. Now you can see what will go in that boot of mine. Picnic gear, tents, lots of good eats and sporting gear too. For most Australians, the arrival of the Holden wasn't just convenient, it was symbolic. This was becoming, after all, the lucky country. Boy, oh boy, what a life for these youngsters. Lots of sunshine and a whole ocean to swim in. The thought that these children would live in a world of computer design, robots and a Holden made in Japan would never have crossed Australia's mind. Next week, we'll continue the Holden story through the years of success to the present, a time when overseas competition and new technology threaten the very survival of the Holden and the entire Australian car industry. Behold!